John Owen is frequently acknowledged as a leading figure of the Puritan and nonconformist movements of the 17th century. And so, as one historian has said, Owen was indisputably the leading proponent of high Calvinism in England in the late 17th century. But Owen's importance in 17th century England. He is probably the most important theologian in the history of the church to come out of England. And so he is a remarkable figure for us in the annals of church history. Now, Owen's distinguished life warrants his importance and warrants us gathering together today to think about his teaching on the subject of general revelation. But this raises a basic question. Who in the world is John Owen and why should I care? Well, Owen was a pastor's pastor. He was a theologian par excellence. But he was also a figure right at the heart of the political, social, and cultural life in the most tumultuous period in the history of England in the 17th century. So Owen was an advisor to Oliver Cromwell. He was the vice chancellor of Oxford University. He was dean of Christ's church. He was a profound polemicist, and he argued against heretics and heterodoxical teaching and popish errors. He loved to talk about communion with God and mortification of sin. You see, Owen was a statesman. He was an educator. He was a polemicist. He was a theologian. One of his colleagues by the name of Ambrose Barnes said that he was the Calvin of England. Another one of his interlocutors said he was the Atlas of Independency. Because Owen, perhaps more than any other person in the late 17th century, argued for tolerance to be granted to nonconformists like himself. So popular, in fact, was Owen in the 17th century that one Quaker who was quite upset about Owen's fame wrote him a letter complaining that he could not go into an alehouse in the county or the countryside of England without people talking about the works of Dr. Owen. Now, I don't know what is more incredible about that statement that it reflects the fame of Owen or the quality of the readership in the alehouses of England. <laughs> so Owen was an incredibly well-known figure by the poor and the powerful alike. Indeed, it was Owen who preached before Parliament the day after Charles I was beheaded. And it was Owen who met a tinker who was in prison in Bedford who was working on this obscure little manuscript by the name of Pilgrim's Progress. And Owen took Bunyan's manuscript to his own publisher by the name of Nathaniel Ponder. And Owen was the guy that ensured that Bunyan's manuscript was published, and it's never gone out of print since. And so Owen was something like the Billy Graham of his day. All right? He was known by everyone. But perhaps more than anything else you need to know about Owen is that he was first and foremost a pastor and minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is important for us as we take up the topic of Owen's teaching on general revelation. Now, on this topic, 
Owen did not say anything new. He just simply repeated what others had said before him. And so his views were very much in line with Augustine and Aquinas and Calvin. In fact, Owen fundamentally agreed with the opening section of chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is largely seen as the greatest uh, consolidated statement of the doctrine of revelation in the history of the Reformed Church. And Owen, as a Congregationalist, led the Savoy Assembly, which restated Westminster's teaching on Revelation. And so in many ways, what's remarkable about Owen is that he didn't say anything new. He was faithful to the teaching of God's Word that had been taught throughout the annals of history. And so Owen actually never wrote an entire book on the subject of general revelation. He actually preferred to call this doctrine natural theology. That is, theology as it was embedded in nature, as God intended theology to be in the Garden of Eden. And so his thoughts on this topic are actually sprinkled all throughout his writings. But one of the most clear and concise treatments of general revelation may be found in one of Owen's earliest writings. In fact, it's actually a small catechism that Owen wrote in his first pastorate in a small village known as Fordham in the county of Essex, which is in southeast England. Now, the work is simply titled, quote, Two Short Catechisms. Now, if you know anything about Owen, he rarely is ever short and concise and pithy. Prolix was more his style. And yet, he has a helpful subtitle, wherein the principles of the doctrine of Christ are are unfolded and explained. In other words, this was a catechism to help people understand the person and work of Christ. And it's in this context that he expounds the doctrine of general revelation. Now, Owen published his two small catechisms in the year 1645. He was just 29 years of age. Now, the work represents Owen at his most accessible. We see the heart of Owen, the pastor. And if you've never read anything by Owen, perhaps this is one of the best first places to go because you see in a fairly small fashion uh, his theology of the gospel. Well, Owen opens this work with these words. And as I say, they expose the heart of the man. He says, quote, My heart's desire and request unto God for you is that you may be saved. My heart's desire for you before God is that you may be saved. This isn't abstract, cold, distant theology. This is theology with a purpose. Theology for the purpose of knowing the true and living triune God. You see, Owen cared deeply about the people that the ascended Lord Jesus Christ had entrusted into his care. He would actually travel from house to house to house, and he would catechize the people in his congregation as they would prepare for the Lord's Supper. So, during communion seasons, right, where they would prepare themselves to take of the supper in a manner that's worthy of the gospel, Owen would visit his people, young and old, to determine that they were indeed ready and fit to come to the table. Indeed, next to the preaching of the word, Owen believed that catechizing his people was the most important work he did as a pastor. In other words, We are called to know the souls of the people that we teach. You see, conferences are wonderful places, 
all right, they're much like retreats, all right? They're like hotels. They're, they're wonderful places to go for a season, all right, for a short weekend, but you, you, can, you can't live in a retreat center. You can't live in a hotel, right? The natural habitat for theological development is not a conference or a college, but your local church where you're known by your pastors and your elders and your Sunday school teachers who love you and care for you and can lead you by the hand to green pastures and still waters that you might yourself daily feast on the truth of God's Word. Are you known? Is there somebody in your church who knows you, who cares for you, who loves you, who catechizes you? who checks in on you, says, how you doing? How can I be praying for you? How's your relationship to the Lord? Well, it's in that context that Owen writes these two short catechisms. Now, one is what he calls a lesser catechism. It's only two or three pages in length. And the lesser catechism is geared towards the children. And the greater catechism is geared toward, right, older siblings and parents. All right, the reason why that's important is because everybody in the local church is important. Everybody needs the Word of God. All the Word of God for all the people of God all the time. All right, as ministers of the gospel, we want young and old to know the truth of God's word. In fact, do you know that's why at the Westminster Assembly we have both a shorter catechism and larger catechism? All right, the great Scottish Presbyterian Samuel Rutherford said that we need to have both milk and meat in order to give to the people of God, right? Milk is seen in the shorter catechism. Meat is seen in the larger catechism because as God's people, we need a steady diet of all the Word of God. And so Owen developed these two catechisms, one for children and one for adults. Now, why do I say that? Why is this important? Because you need to understand, beloved, The doctrine of general revelation isn't an obscure doctrine. This isn't something simply for professionals, right? For scholars and theologians and pastors. No. The doctrine of general revelation is for the people of God. It's for children in 17th century Essex. And you know what? It's also for boys and girls in Sanford, Florida in the 21st century, right? This is a doctrine for you. This isn't a doctrine just for those of us who have the privilege of teaching theology. No, this is vital for you in knowing the truth of who God is and how He's disclosed Himself in His Word and most importantly in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a catechism basically is bite-sized theology in a question-and-answer format, all right? Bite-sized theology in a question-and-answer format, all right? What is the chief end of man? You see, bite-sized theology in a question-and-answer format. It's a way that pastors can drill the truth of God's Word into the hearts of God's people. So a catechism reflects on the totality of Scripture and boils it down in a bite-sized fashion and develops it in this Q&A fashion. Well, Owen begins his catechism on the doctrine of Scripture. Then he moves to the doctrine of God and Trinity. And then only after establishing the doctrine of Scripture and the doctrine of God does he develop his doctrine of general revelation? And here in a series of six questions, he outlines his natural theology in miniature. And what I want to do is just walk through these six questions with you. All right, you're going to have to have your thinking cap on. You're going to have to work through this. 
Understand this is in 17th century language, all right? But I'll try to unpack it as we walk through uh, Owen's Q&A. Remember, this isn't the lesser catechism. This is the greater catechism here. And since you're at an RBC Winter Conference, I think you can handle the greater catechism here. So Owen begins with this question. What are the works of God that outwardly respect His creatures? What are the works of God that outwardly respect His creatures? Answer, first, creation. Second, providence. All right, that's pretty easy. Where is general revelation discovered? Creation and providence. All right, Owen actually here distinguishes between what he calls inward and outward works of God. God's inward works represent the inward operations of the Trinity in ordaining all that comes to pass. The outward works of God correspond to the inner operations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's outward works represent the execution of the divine decree for the glory of God and the good of His people. And so when we talk about general revelation, we are speaking about the disclosure of God's will in the realms of creation and providence. The heavens declare the glory of God. Or as Moses will say in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God, right? The inward work of God. But the things revealed belong to us, and how else does it go? And to our children. Now, the things revealed include general and special revelation, And so, Owen here is zeroing in on general revelation, the outward work of God in creation and providence. And that revelation reveals information to us about who God is and how He's revealed Himself to us. Now, this revelation is general because it manifests the knowledge of God to all people in all times, in all places. This general revelation yields basic, fundamental knowledge of God. As Owen will go on to state, quote, the very outward works of God are sufficient to convince men of His eternal power and to leave them inexcusable if they serve Him not. In other words, all of the world and all of history speaks to the power of God. Perhaps some of you last night were out at midnight to see this remarkable lunar eclipse with all of its orange and red hues. We uh, got our, at least our two oldest children up out of bed in order for them to Behold the majesty and the wonder and the beauty of the glory of God. All right? God's character, God's might and power is unveiled for us all right, in the lunar eclipses of creation. The outward work of God in creation and providence. But this raises a more fundamental question. What is the work of creation, Owen asks? Well, he says, an act of work of God's almighty power, whereby of nothing in six days He created heaven, earth, and the sea with all things in them contained. Not the most memorable answer, I suspect. All right, but what are the works of creation? All right, the works of creation are, are God's work of power when He created everything that exists, seen and unseen, in the space of six days. In other words, Owen is embedding his doctrine of general revelation in the soil 
of the creation account in Genesis 1 to 3. Understand the creation account represents the genesis of humanity, the genesis of all that is. And so let's reflect just for a few minutes on the importance of the opening chapters of Genesis for a doctrine of general revelation. You all know that Genesis 1-1 opens with those magnificent words, in the beginning God created. Now these words speak volumes to us of the supremacy of God. He is incomparable. He is in a class by Himself. You see, in no uncertain terms, Genesis 1 is about God. The spotlight of the text is placed not on creation, but on the Creator. As a result, the Creator alone gets all the glory. He is the subject of the creation story, the agent of the creation story, and therefore He is the object of creation's praise. Now, when you read Genesis 1, something remarkable happens. You actually see that the generic name for God, Elohim, is used something like 32 times throughout Genesis 1 alone. It's as though Moses is wanting us to get the main point of the story. Everything, everything that exists centers on the Creator God. And so Genesis 1 presents us with a history of the beginning of all things, seen and unseen. But Genesis 1 also begs the question for us, what was there before the beginning of time? And a moment's reflection will lead us to at least one of three possible conclusions. We might say that before the world began, nothing and no one existed. But how does something come from someone or nothing or no one? How do we explain the art of Rembrandt, the music of Handel, the literature of Shakespeare, the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright? We all understand that nothing, right, does truly produce nothing. Now, we'll caveat that in a minute, all right? But you could say before the beginning of time, there was nothing and no one. Second, you could say before the beginning of time, there was something. That is, before the world, an impersonal something existed, and the world was created from it, all right? As a result of the random collision of particles. But this is the problem of personality, isn't it? How does something that's personal come from something that's non-personal? If we are the result of the random collision of particles, how do we explain the giggle of a child? Right? A funny personality. Right, the beauty of a piece of music, the love between a husband and wife, the affection that friends enjoy. You could say before the world began, there was an impersonal something, but it raises a question. How does what is personal all right, come from what is impersonal? And then finally, we can say before the world began, there was an infinite, eternal, personal God that someone existed. As Francis Schaeffer very famously said, that God is there and He is not silent. That He created the world out of nothing in that He did not rely upon anything outside of Himself. All right, who is God that He needs a counselor? Who is God that he has to phone a friend? Who, who is God that he has to deduce, you know, rationally to solve a problem? 
No, this God spoke all things into existence by the word of his power through the exertion of his sovereign omnipotent will. And so Genesis 1 provides us with a full-orbed origin account of the history of all that is. God creates all things out of nothing by the word of his power. Therefore, we have a basis for all purpose and personality in this life. So Owen says, what, are, what is general revelation? Well, the domains of general revelation are creation and providence. What's the work of creation? It's God creating all things in the space of six days. Third, wherefore did God make man? For his own glory, in his servants and obedience. Question four, was man able to yield the service and worship that God required of him? Yes, to the uttermost, being created upright in the image of God in purity, innocency, righteousness, and holiness. Again, notice what John Owen is doing. He's painting a picture of general revelation, and then he's embedding it in the soil of Genesis 1. Genesis 1 confronts us with the existence of a personal, infinite God who existed before time and who reveals himself that he may be known. And at the apex of this creation, at the apex of this general revelation, stands man who is in the image of God. And so it raises the question, what is the image of God? We'll turn very, very briefly to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to notice the the logic of the text. Picking up in verse 26 of Genesis 1, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. All right, so God said, let us make man in our image. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So the image of God here is defined in terms of three related ideas. First, in terms of our character. Second, in terms of God's command. And third, in terms of communion. In terms of character, we reflect the moral composition of God. God created us to reflect His dignity, His holiness, His righteousness, right? We were created with the capacity of relating to this perfect and holy God. There is a moral quality to the image of God, our character. But next, notice in the text, there is a command. As image bearers, we are created under the authority of God. God's Word, in other words, always governs His people. And so likeness to God is expressed in conformity to the Word of God. All right, as image bearers, we exist to commune with God under the authority of His Word. And so we're created upright to reflect the character of God. And as creatures that reflect His character and holiness, we are given God's command and His Word. Understand that even before the fall, even before sin, we needed God's Word to relate to God, right? God had to give us instruction for how to relate to Him rightly, even in the Garden of Eden. And so there's character, there's command, and thirdly, there is communion. We are created to know, love, and worship God. Notice the logic of the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. You have the image of God. You have a command that's given. You have blessing that is enjoyed. And you have rest. 
Understand, dear friends, the first full day that man enjoyed on planet Earth was spent in Sabbath worship before the triune and living God. All right? We were made for worship. We were made for communion with God. And that communion is the essence of God's blessing. Right? In the garden, we were under the umbrella of God's blessing as we enjoyed face-to-face communion with God. Right? But the curse represents being under the hand of God's judgment when we do not worship God rightly, but we rebel against Him by failing to keep His Word. And so the image of God is seen in the coalescence of character, command, and communion. Owen keeps on going. Fifthly, he asks this question, what was the rule whereby man was at first to be directed in his obedience? Now, this is a mouthful. Just kind of feel the weight of Owen's answer here. The moral or eternal law of God implanted in his nature and written in his heart by creation, being the tenor of the covenant between God and him, sacramentally typified by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's a lot to unpack that we don't have time to do so today. But what I, what I want you to see is perhaps what is most unique about Owen's doctrine of general revelation is that he builds it with the architecture of covenant theology. That before the fall, God entered into a covenant relationship with Adam. This relationship was sovereignly administered. God voluntarily entered into a relationship with Adam and Eve. He was under no obligation to enter into this relationship. Secondly, this relationship was immediate. Adam was not in need of a mediator. There was no go-between Adam and God, but there was face-to-face contact. God directly gave Adam his word. And then finally, this covenant was based on or contingent on Adam's obedience, right? Be fruitful and multiply positively, negatively. Do not take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is a positive and negative command. And so the relationship that Adam enjoyed was covenantal in nature, And that law that governed that relationship was seen in Adam's conscience, the law written on the heart, as well as the law that was given directly to Adam by God's command. And so this communion was controlled by covenant. And so natural theology refers to the way that you and I related to our humanity related to God before the fall, all right, as creation was originally ordered. And so when we see the glory of God in creation, when we even are confronted with the law of God written on the heart, we are confronted with a standard of God that has remained from the very beginning of time, a standard which we all have fallen from. And this, of course, then leads to the very last question that Owen raises. Sixthly, he says, Do we stand in the same covenant still, and have we the same power to yield obedience to God? And the answer he gives is no. The covenant was broken by the sin of Adam with whom it was made, and our nature corrupted, and all power to do good utterly lost. You see... Adam could not guarantee a stable relationship with God. A covenant is only as stable as the mediator it depends upon. All right? If Adam is our head, all right, the stability of our relationship with God falls. Adam disobeyed, and all in Adam fell with him. 
And so we're not born in righteousness and holiness, right? But we are born in sin, as David will say in Psalm 51. So we are unable to commune with God. Our character is corrupted. We fail to heed the command of God, and we no longer enjoy communion with Him. The image of God, though it remains, has been marred, and sin has affected the totality of our being, so that we no longer worship the God that is disclosed to us in creation and providence. We need another. And what is remarkable is that Owen reflects on this principle in a very important devotional work he wrote on an exposition of Psalm 130. Psalm 130 was important to Owen, and he wrote this book after having a crisis of assurance in his own life. Owen grew up in a Christian home. He received a Christian education. He was a minister of the gospel, and yet he struggled with his standing before God. And the Lord did a mighty work of assurance in his life where he enjoyed the forgiveness of God's sins in Christ. And as a result, he wrote this exposition of Psalm 130. Remember there, the psalmist says, O Lord, if you would mark my iniquities, I could not stand in your presence. Right? My sin cripples me. It condemns me. It stares me down and haunts me in my guilt and shame. And Owen makes this phenomenal observation about the limits of natural theology in his exposition of Psalm 130. And he says that creation and providence do yield a proper knowledge of God, but he says we will never come to know the knowledge of God's forgiveness in general revelation. You'll never be confronted with God's forgiveness if all you do is look to the law of God within or attempt to behold the glory of God without. You see, that's what happens to so many people today. They're on a quest for forgiveness, and they look for the solution in themselves. They look to the solution for guilt and shame everywhere else in creation. But dear friends, the only place where forgiveness is found is in the arms of Jesus Christ. You stand condemned before God under natural theology. But on the basis of evangelical theology, on the basis of faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ as He's given to you in the gospel, you do not face God's wrath for your guilt you face God's grace in His forgiveness. And so, dear friends, in a conference on general revelation, I suspect many of you are here today and you know the guilt and shame of your own sin. Dear friends, you will not find relief for that guilt unless you fly into the arms of Christ. Right, Thomas Watson, another Puritan, says, Faith and repentance are the two wings into which we fly into the arms of God. Have you repented of your sins and trusted in Christ as He's given to you in the gospel? So Owen's heart of a pastor is disclosed for us in these catechism questions as he teaches his congregates, the importance of general revelation. And the importance of general revelation is not only that it gives us knowledge of the glory of God, but it drives us into the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we find the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we find the forgiveness of sins. Help us to know him today. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.